Hello everyone. My name is Andy Hopper and I'm a Senior Solutions Architect at Amazon Web Services. It can be awfully useful to have your applications automatically installed on an instance as soon as it's launched. A good example would be auto-scaling. You'd like new instances to be launched in response to peaks in load, and you don't want to have to wait for a human being to connect to the machine and install your software. Now, there are a number of ways this can be accomplished, but in this video, we're going to explore how you can use a feature of Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2, called user data. For those of you who aren't familiar with this feature, it's a way for you to provide a script that will be executed on the machine during the launch process. This script can be a Windows batch script or a PowerShell script on Windows machines, or it can be a shell script for Linux machines. Now, for the purposes of this video, we're going to focus on the Windows use case. However, the same set of steps can be performed on a Linux box. You'll just be using a different syntax for the script. So, let's get started. Now, what I have open here in Visual Studio is an ASP.NET Core MVC web application. By the way, the source for this application is publicly available on GitHub. So, if you want to take a peek at the code for this, as well as some other videos I'll be posting on this topic, you can download it and try it out in your own environment. Now, I'd like for this application to be able to launch automatically on boot and stay running. So, I've added the NuGet package that allows me to host the application as a, a Windows service. So, I've got my application, I've got it set up to run, and so now I just need to figure out how I'm going to get this to automatically install on EC2 machines. Now, one principle we adhere to in the cloud is to automate everything, and this includes the creation of resources like EC2 instances. So AWS offers a service called CloudFormation, and what this allows you to do is build documents that describe the cloud resources you'd like to have created. One of the resource types is EC2 instances, and if you look at the documentation for the EC2 resource type, you'll see that there's a property here called user data. And so if we look at the value of this property, uh, we'll see that it takes a script as a, with base64 encoding. Okay, so let's consider the steps I'll want my user data script to perform. I'd like for it to download and install the ASP.NET Core runtime. I'd like to download my application. I'd like to configure the application to run as a Windows service. And then finally, I'll ensure that my application is accessible on the standard HTTP port of 80. Now, before I write my script, let's go over a couple of things. User data can take two forms. It can be an inline script that runs a sequence of commands, or it can use something called AWS CloudFormation init. It is considered a best practice to use AWS CloudFormation init as it supports features such as updating the steps and can handle reboots if one is required during execution. Scripts are much simpler to write, but since they don't support these features, you'll want to determine whether you'll need them. We'll go over both approaches in this video though. Okay, so let's write our script. Now to spare you my atrocious typing, I've taken the liberty of already writing the script and I've pulled up a copy here. Let's take a look at what I'm actually doing. First, I'm downloading and installing the ASP.NET runtime onto the machine. Then you'll notice I'm using a feature of PowerShell while I'm telling PowerShell to wait for the installer to complete before it moves on in the script. In this case, you'll want to do that because if you don't, the ASP.NET installer will come back immediately, and then we may try to start our service before the runtime actually has finished installing. Next, I'm downloading the zip file that contains my application, and I've got it stored in a bucket that, uh, that I have access to. And then what I'm doing is I'm expanding the zip file onto the local hard drive for the machine. Now that I have the runtime and my application code in place, it's time for me to go ahead and register a Windows service. So I'm just using the new service commandlet to create that Windows service. And then I'll start the service just so I can start serving up my web pages. And then finally, to ensure I can reach this from the outside world, I'm using the, uh, the NetShell advanced firewall command sets to expose port 80 for HTTP traffic to reach my web application. So what would something like this look like in uh, CloudFormation? So I've got a CloudFormation template here. Uh, that's, this is also included in the source code for that GitHub application, by the way. And let's take a look at the resources we have. One of the resources, among other things, is the actual EC2 instance that's going to be running our web application. The other things are some nuts and bolts, like a security group to allow access on port 80, an Elastic IP address to uh, make it available to the public internet. And then uh, I've got something called a wait handle and wait condition. We'll look at what those do in just a moment. So if we expand our uh, resources here, you'll notice that I've got a user data property. 
Now, you may recall from the documentation that the user data expects a Base64 encoded script. Uh, luckily, there is an intrinsic function inside CloudFormation that makes our job pretty easy, and it will do this for us. So if we uh, look in this, the script that I've got here, you'll see that's the exact same steps that I had in this PowerShell script here. But what I've done is I've actually added a little bit of a try-catch handler to it. Uh, and the reason I did that is that I want to be able to signal to CloudFormation that the script has either successfully executed or it encountered an error condition of some sort. And to do that, what I'm actually using is something called a wait handle. So you'll notice that, you know, again, I have these wait handles and wait conditions down here. And so what this will actually do is give me a URL that I can uh, perform a put operation on to indicate to CloudFormation that my script has either successfully executed or if any encountered a failure of some sort. If I didn't use the wait handle to indicate this uh, success or failure, what will happen is the CloudFormation will launch the EC2 machine and my EC2 user data will begin execution, but it won't wait for that user data to complete. And so you may end up in a state where your user data fails, but CloudFormation thinks the stack launched successfully. So again, by leveraging this wait handle, I've got a way to be able to ensure that the stack overall will fail if something happens that causes my script to fail. So the way this works is you call invoke web request, and again, you indicate that you're calling the put verb. And if we look all the way over to the right here, uh, what I'm doing is I'm actually invoking a URI, and this URI is defined by that app server wait handle. And you'll notice that what I'm doing when in the JSON that I'm passing to that put method, I'm actually indicating a status code. So success if everything worked well, and a failure if something went wrong. And again, that URI, is defined by, by virtue of the fact that CloudFormation has this app server wait handle. And then if you look here with this wait condition, what's going on is that I've got something that's going to be waiting for this app server wait handle to be triggered with either a success or a failure. And then I've got an associated timeout. In this case, I've told it to wait 10 minutes or 600 seconds. Now, one other thing I wanted to show you is, you know, I'm doing this in CloudFormation right now, but if you want to do this directly inside the EC2 launch wizard, you can. You'd simply go to launch a new instance, and in the launch wizard, you'll have an option to enter user data as part of the advanced settings of your launch steps. So let's take a look at this. I'll choose Windows Server. I'll make it a T2 Micro. And if we go down to the advanced details, you'll see I also have user data. And you can either attach it you know, directly in line uh, as text, so I could cut and paste my PowerShell script in here, or I can have it you know, upload a file to the EC2 launch wizard. Just bear in mind, when you're using this approach, you won't have access to, the, uh, to those CloudFormation features like wait handles. That's a CloudFormation-only construct. OK, well, now it's time for us to go ahead and launch our CloudFormation template. So let's go to the CloudFormation console, and we'll create a stack. And in this case, I'm going to upload that uh, user data template that I created. And I will navigate to my ASP.NET Core deployment samples. I've got a CloudFormation, and I will use my user data template. And it's going to ask me for a stack name, and I'll call this ASP.NET Demo dash user data. And you'll notice I've got a parameter in here. This is just a way for me to uh, automatically look up the latest Windows AMI ID rather than having to hard code it, because uh, after all, I've, over time, those AMI IDs do expire. All right, I will go ahead and scoot to the end here, and I will create our stack. Now, rather than make you wait for the entire stack to complete launching, I'm going to leverage the miracle of video editing and uh, fast forward through time. So I will see you on the other side. All right, so our CloudFormation stack has finished launching and I actually create an output on the template. So uh, just to make it easier to navigate to the web application. So let's go ahead and click on this hyperlink and see if our app will actually start getting served. And look at that, there you go. So our application is now up and running on our EC2 machine, and it was installed automatically as part of launching that EC2 instance. Okay, so that's how we get our application installed using a script inside our user data. 
Now let's take a look at it, what it looks like if we use that CFN init script. What I have here, and again, this is also available in that GitHub repository, is a CloudFormation template where uh, instead of using an inline user data script, I've got my EC2 instance, and now instead I'm actually supplying that AWS CloudFormation init section. This is a section that goes inside the metadata for the EC2 instance, and it's got a slightly different structure. So you'll notice I give it a configuration, and rather than manually downloading the files, I'm actually letting CloudFormation take care of doing that for me. So I give it a list of all the files that I want to have on the machine. In this case, I'm actually supplying the content for the file in line for the CFN hub. We'll describe what that is in just a moment. I'm also configuring an auto reloader. Again, we'll take a look at those in just a moment. But the most important part is I'm downloading the source for my application as well as the location of the ASP.NET runtime installer. So I was able to skip those. Now you'll notice below what I have is a sequence of steps that I'm going to have that CFN init uh, script perform for me. And the way this works is you give it an alphabetically ordered list of commands that you want it to have execute. Incidentally, you can tell it to either do it in ascending or descending order. Uh, you just specify that at the top of your configuration. But you'll see what I'm doing here is I'm uh, running the commands. So I'll install my ASP.NET runtime here, and then I'm executing a PowerShell command to expand my archive, just like I did in the original script. And then I'm registering the service. Now, in this case, since it's not a PowerShell execution environment, I'm actually using sc.exe to register my service, but the end result is going to be the same. I start my service, and then again, I will open up port 80 on the firewall. Now, I mentioned uh, that CFN hub service uh, uh, back up in the config section there. What this is, is a service that allows you to respond to updates in the metadata configuration of your EC2 instance. I mentioned earlier how user data is unable to be updated in this way, and this service is what detects any of those changes to the metadata so that it can alter any uh, configuration on the EC2 instance. So as you can see, it's a, it's a slightly more verbose way to get the user data information onto the EC2 machine. However, it's much more robust and it offers some features that you don't get uh, just using an inline script and user data. Oh yes, one other thing I did want to point out is that you do still need to supply a script for, for executing user data. What you'll notice what I'm doing is I'm calling cfn init.exe and this is actually going to be consuming the data that's in that metadata section to configure the EC2 instance. And then again, at the end here, I wanted to ensure that my CloudFormation template waited for my uh, CFN init to complete. So I'm actually using a, a application called CFN signal. And again, it's actually sending a, a copy of my uh, wait handle, you know, as a, as a parameter to CFN signal so we can execute that put command for us. All right, so let's see what this looks like in practice when we launch a CloudFormation template. We'll create a new stack. We'll upload the template file. And we'll, this time, instead of doing the user data one, we'll do the CFN init. And I'll give it a similar name, ASP.NET demo, except this one will be CFN init. Well, next through here and then we will create our stack. And again, rather than make you wait, I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward through the uh, execution of the stack. So see you on the other side in just a moment. All right, so our CloudFormation template is finished launching. And again, we're gonna go to the outputs tab and let's go ahead and see if our application launches. Awesome. So as you can see, there's a little more work to do if you use the AWS CloudFormation init approach, but it's really powerful. Okay. So let's go over what we did here. In this video, we looked at how you can use user data. It's a very powerful way for you to customize the EC2 instances that you uh, create using CloudFormation. You can add this user data to your CloudFormation templates or you can use it inside the EC2 console. And then we also reviewed the, uh, the two approaches you can use with user data, uh, either, using either an inline script, which can either be a command.exe or bash shell script if you're using Linux, or it can use PowerShell uh, if you're on a Windows machine. 
We also looked at how you can configure the AWS CloudFormation init section as well, so that you have the ability to make even modifications and updates to those later on after you've launched your EC2 instance. Thanks for watching, and again, here is the link for that uh, GitHub repo if you want to download and try out this code for yourself. Again, thanks for watching, and we can't wait to see what you built on AWS.